Offside Broadcast, the best Vox casting either side of the breach. That was Mrs. Dahl with another edition of her Dungeon Diary. I can't wait to hear what happens with the fanged monster's first day at school next week. Onwards, upwards, and sidewards, this is Tales of Malifaux, coming to you live from the Breachside Broadcast Studios. Well, as alive as any of us can be, trapped in our mortal forms, fragile meat shells that they are. Today, we are rounding off our look at the different factions vying for power in Malifaux, with two stories. One looking at the famous mercenaries led by Von Schiel, and the other is an audio recording of a trip into the Bayou Wetlands. Yes, six stories for six power players. That's the lot. There is definitely no one else. Yep. Anywho, a warning! Be alert, listeners. Tell everyone not listening to, because this stuff is important. Rumours and scuttlebutt are doing the rounds about wandering, shimmering holes or rogue temporal shifts, in layman's terms. These holes are several feet tall and wide, appear suddenly, and look like heat rising from a warm pavement. And most importantly of all, they have a furious dislike of household pets. I have been advised by the guild to let everybody know to stay away from these holes. If we don't make them angry, then we'll be fine. If you encounter one, slowly back away, and for governor's sake, do not throw anything into it. It's not big, and it's not clever. All kind of bizarre time fractures could happen. Here is our first story, looking at the outcasts. Outcasts. Squatting on his haunches, Misha shielded himself in a tumble-down pile of debris that might once have been a home. Most areas in the quarantine zone were in one state or another of disrepair. To find crumbling blocks of empty homes and businesses, leaning drunkenly against one another or out over the streets, was common to those exploring the massive ruin that was the city. But these particular blocks were in even worse shape. Here, ruined cobble streets were strewn with the debris of collapsed buildings, while the remaining structures needed only a nudge to bring them crashing down as well. The sheer volume of detritus both simplified and complicated his job at the same time, allowing him to move virtually silently and unnoticed through the rubble, but forcing him to keep his eyes and ears scanning for threats doing the same. His alertness had caught the sound of activity ahead, the scrape of metal on rock telling him no mere beast lay in his path, so he waited. Despite orders to the contrary, Misha usually left his helmet clipped to his belt when scouting. Leaving the head unprotected was a foolish risk. The captain chided him frequently. The Freiko invests as much in you and your skills as we do in the armor that you wear, Misha. Do not waste my investment. Misha understood the captain's concerns, but was paid for his results not for his ability to follow Freikorps protocol. His perceptions were dulled when he wore the helmet. His ability to see and hear clearly were far better protection in this situation than armor could ever be. Besides, he wasn't here alone. Two hundred paces behind Misha, the remainder of the six-man squad waited for his all-clear signal. He chuckled to himself at their efforts to keep silent as they hid among the rubble. Whatever was making the noise ahead wouldn't hear them. But to his sharp hearing, they might as well have been banging pots and pans together, singing church hymns. He placed his finger over his lips and mined a shushing motion. Certain Frank or Cameron would see it. The rhythmic metal-on-stone sound continued. Misha crept slowly forward, leaving his hiding place for a better vantage point. He held his rifle loosely, ready to bring it to bear on whatever might present itself as a target. A few slow feet put him close enough to see where the racket was coming from. The wreckage of two city blocks lay below him, swallowed by a massive sinkhole. Tunnel mouths honeycombed the sides of the sinkhole. Some collapsed, others yawning wide. 
For a moment he wondered what had caused the destruction, before his attention was drawn to the noise. Milling around the rubble like lethargic ants, several figures were working to clear the wreckage, some with their bare hands, others with shovels and picks. Misha scanned the workers with the rifle's scope, all too aware of the deception of appearances in this place. Resurrectionists. He counted dozens of undead down there, all working toward whatever goal their controller had given him. He tried to pick out the unholy creature who'd given unlife to these poor souls, but the terrain made it impossible at this range. Instead, he made mental note of their positions and numbers, then carefully made his way back from the sinkhole's edge, very much glad he was not alone. The smell of charred meat and burning timber stung Misha's nose as he made his way down the side of the sinkhole to join the other freikormen below, the echoes of his shots still chattering against the surrounding buildings. The fighting had been thickest toward the center of the ruin, where an unbroken building corner had sheltered the resurrectionist from attack until Misha's bullet had found his head. Without their puppeteer controlling them, most of the undead had collapsed in piles of decaying flesh and bone. A few remaining pockets of resistance fought on as Misha made his way to the captain, but the occasional foosh of Franklin's Flammenwerfer told him the mopping up was well underway. To know what they were looking for, Cameron, and I want to know now. We've lost one man, and I would not have it be for nothing. The captain turned as Misha approached. He had already removed his own helmet. Bald pate shining with sweat as he chewed on a cigar. Misha wondered where Captain Von Schill kept those things while the helmet was on. Ah, trapper. Well done with the resurrectionist. Thank you, sir. His eyes drifted to where Alejandro lay. Armor and the man it had protected torn open, and offered a silent prayer for the man's soul. Alejandro had thrown himself at one of the undead creatures, this one half again as tall as a man when it attacked Von Schill. His efforts had protected the captain, but it cost the Freikorpsman his life. Orders? Von Schill paused a moment. Ready Alejandro's body. I won't leave one of mine out here for the carrion or worse. After that, I want you to give Cameron what he needs. That horse son was looking for something. Something valuable, I guess, if he was all the way out here. I'm depending on you, Cameron, to find out what it was. Misha set about the sobering task given to him, while Cameron started his own work. The captain had already moved off to check the other squad members. The pair worked in silence for several minutes. Cameron skimmed through copious notes stuffed into a leather satchel and compared what he found to strange markings etched into the stonework around them, while Misha carefully removed Alejandro's armor, stacking it reverently to one side of the body. Once the armor was removed, Misha fumbled around in the dead corpsman's kit for a blanket, closed Alejandro's eyes, and swaddled the corpse as best he could in its own blanket, although he was no priest. Misha whispered the few words he remembered, from prayers his father had said over the graves of men he'd attended back in Warsaw. Grant him absolution, give him peace. Deep in study, Cameron did not register Misha's approach. He stood for a moment and watched the librarian work. Misha wondered if the inclusion of such support helped or hindered the squad. He was an experienced fighting man, and getting used to the strangeness of Malifaux took time. The threats the Freikorps were hired to confront often required more than mundane weapons and tactics, but even so, he felt these arcane researchers better served them far from the front line. They provided useful intelligence and analysis of threats from their dusty stacks. When they were brought into the field as active support, all too often Misha or the others found themselves saving the librarian's bacon rather than the other way around. The captain worked hard to ensure all of his mercenaries were contributing members of the Freikorps, but the bit of combat training librarians were given before being sent out with the squad was in Misha's opinion, less than useful. Oblivious to Misha's presence, Cameron carefully examined what appeared to have once been the wall of some sort of structure. His finger followed an intricately carved line across the pieces of rubble, checking what he had traced against a sketch in a small book of handwritten notes. Find anything? Cameron jerked to his feet, dropping the notebook as he fumbled for the hunting knife. What? Oh, woo. You startled me, Misha. I could have done worse than that, Misha observed as he handed the notebook back to Cameron. You have to be more alert out here in the field, Cameron. This isn't the classroom. The librarian's ears reddened. This was only his second trip into the field since joining the Corps. 
but it was already the second time Misha or one of the other men had been called upon to babysit him. I know, damn it, I know. But don't you find all of this? His wave encompassed the sinkhole around them. So very intriguing. Misha kicked as a rock. Other than getting out of here alive and with her paychecks intact, not really. I get to do a job, so are you. Cameron straightened. I am doing my job. Look, these carvings are writing of some sort, very different from what I know of the ancient Malifaux language. Right now it's beyond me to decipher, but given time and the correct reference books. Out came several sheets of paper and a stick of charcoal. He began to take rubbings of the engravings, muttering about ancient cultures and dialects. So you can't make sense of it here? No, not without a clear point of reference as to where this language and that of old Malifaux cross, like the Rosetta Stone. Misha sighed. Did you check the body? The charcoal paused mid-rub. The what? The body. The accursed resurrectionist body. If he was here looking for something, maybe he knew what he was looking at. Cameron's ears reddened again. I hadn't thought of that. Misha wondered if there would ever be hope for him as a field operative. Then maybe we should go check. The body of the resurrectionist lay where he had died. His eyes were open. His eyes were open. A surprised expression, as if he could not believe he was dead, across his face. Cameron turned away from the grisly scene when they came across the body, dry heaving. Death was never pretty. So what are we looking for? Uh, um, look around for any sort of reference materials. Books, maps, notes, even pieces of marked stone that look decidedly different from those around them. I'll check the body. Misha gave the librarian credit for that bit of bravado. The search was slow going. Misha quickly gave up on looking for anything printed, having seen Cameron dig a wad of yellowing parchment from underneath the body and focused on the rubble. Patience in the face of tedium was nothing new to him, having spent much of his life as a trapper. He stooped to pick up a promising-looking piece of rock, looked it over, then tossed it aside. Nothing here looked much like anything else, he decided. This is going to take a while. It was a few minutes later when he came across it. An area of ground had been cleared of debris, a long but shallow hole dug in the center. Misha could make out the hint of a marble slab poking up out of the dirt in the hole. Several picks and shovels lay in and scattered about the hole, cast aside when the undead had made their stand against the fry core. Beneath a shovel he found a small marble tablet, its surface chiseled with markings similar to those Cameron had found earlier. As he took a breath to call Cameron, Misha realized he could read the tablet's symbols. He let out the breath, but instead of shouting to Cameron, he began to chant. As he did... Something beneath the marble slab at his feet began to stir. Fascinating, Cameron whispered as he read through the resurrectionist's notes. They summarized what appeared to be four years of painstaking research, essentially from the time the breach reopened to now. He understood now what this place was, had been, in centuries past. He admired the twisted dedication of the man who'd written these notes, understood the unquenchable yearning for knowledge, and the paths it might lead a person. He had followed one such path to this point in time, wondering if his pursuit would end as bloodily as the Resurrectionists. Looking out at the rubble, he wondered what the collection of buildings had looked like when they were whole. Using the roughly copied map he found in the notes, Cameron could almost envision the institution's layout, where the lecture halls had been. Over there, a dormitory. There, the faculty offices. Now all that remained was whatever the elements had passed over. Sighing, Cameron read more of the notes. He could not find reference to what had befallen the people here. Could not be sure how or why the sinkhole was formed, but did see that the man believed secrets were hidden here, somewhere. His random musings posited that the tunnels ringing the sinkhole led to a network of vaults and subfloors beneath the college, but as far as Cameron could tell, he had not investigated them. Instead, the Resurrectionist had focused on the floor of the sinkhole, salvaging what he could while searching for some sort of weapon. Misha! He could see the trapper a ways off, something held in his hands. Misha, we're looking for a piece of stone, a marble tablet. His voice trailed off. No! Don't read from... The ground at Misha's feet erupted with plumes of dirt and broken chunks of marble. Lord, no! Fear gave Cameron's feet wings. 
He was at his companion's side in moments, dragging him away from the ominously silent hole. Come on, Misha, we have to go, now. The trapper shook the cobwebs from his head. He felt like he'd been asleep for a week. Cameron? Oh no, oh no, now. We have to go now. Cameron knew he was raving, but he was desperate to stop it. He could feel the malevolence leaking out of the pit. He managed to leave Amisha onto his feet, slide an arm around him, and began to move back from the edge of the hole. Somehow, Cameron noticed, Misha had held on to his rifle. He wondered if it would have any effect at all. The pair had barely moved out of the cleared patch when a hand reached out from the hole. It was rotting. Much of the flesh had decomposed and fallen away, leaving exposed bones which scrabbled at the edge as it prepared to pull whatever it was attached to out. The hand was massive, capable of grabbing a grown man about the chest and probably crushing the life from him, Cameron thought. Another hand joined the first, both coming out of the dirt and digging back into it. Cameron could not tear his eyes away despite his fear. Something shifted in the hole, and the thing levered itself free, extinguishing Cameron's burning curiosity. The undead giant stood twenty feet tall, skeleton peeking through its rotting flesh. Cameron thought absently that the centuries-old magic keeping it animated and awaiting a summons must have also slowed its decomposition before terror gripped him once again. It flexed its massive hands with grim purpose, fixing its dead sockets on Cameron and Misha. It opened its massive jaw and let out a hiss, far more chilling than the bellow that would have escaped it in life. The giant's appearance cleared Misha's mind like a splash of cold water. What the? Get back, Cameron. It's the college's guardian. The resurrectionist was looking for it here. Thought he could summon and control it. The guardian took a halting step toward them. It seemed to be waking up from its long slumber and needed some time to regain its faculties. Misha was half pulling, half pushing Cameron back from the guardian's tentative advance. He unslung his rifle and took aim at the thing's head. He knew that even if he failed to damage the undead beast, which he anticipated, the other Freikor would hear the shot, if they did not already see the giant, and he hoped it would distract the thing long enough for Cameron to get to safety. The rifle shot cracked loudly, echoing across the sinkhole. The bullet ricocheted off the Guardian's skull, rocking it back and tearing away some of the necrotic flesh still clinging there. The attack seemed to galvanize it, banishing its lethargy. It came at Misha then moving much faster than its massive frame would suggest it was capable of, those terrible hands reaching toward him. Cameron had scrambled up a broken wall to get a better vantage point. A bit away, he could see the captain and the other Freikorsmen brushing toward the sound of Misha's shot, but they would be too late. The Guardian was nearly on top of Misha. He was desperately trying to reload his rifle in time for a last defiant shot. No, Cameron whispered. He began to recite the words rushing out of him in a torrent faster even than his earlier panic shouting. They seemed heavier than the air around them, tearing ripples in it as they rushed toward the Guardian. The words tore at Misha's ears, battering the defences of his psyche as they hammered at the Guardian's back. He moaned in pain, dropping his rifle as he grabbed at his head while the Guardian's charge became a stagger, then collapsed before it could reach him. It struggled to its feet turning to confront its new assailant. Cameron kept up the litany as it stomped toward him, each of its steps more difficult than the last. He reassessed his opinion of the librarian in that instant, realizing that the captain always knew his men better than they themselves did. Cameron's voice grew harsher, hoarse at his recitation. The pain was getting worse, but he knew if he stopped now, the guardian would crush him and then turn back on Misha. The pain burned through him, and he misspoke a syllable, breaking the litany for an instant. The Guardian stumbled forward. It could almost reach him. Jump! Achtung schnell! Jump! Jump! The brief training von Schill required of all his librarians took hold, and Cameron leapt to one side, hurling himself off the wall and into the rubble. As soon as he cleared the wall, he heard and felt the whoosh as Frank let loose a torrent of flame. The other Freikorps men had reached them. Cameron scrambled to his feet as Von Schill and the others rounded on the Guardian. The Flammenwerfer kept up a steady stream of flame, driving the now-burning undead back from Cameron and Misha, who had recovered his weapon and donned his helmet. 
James and Misha kept up a steady stream of lead as rifle and pistol both found their marks. Then the captain was there, barking orders at the three men, his custom weapon's rhythm lending to the symphony. Despite the tearing at his throat, Cameron joined in, lending his solo to the symphony's crescendo, the Freikorpsman's armor dulling its effect on them. The Guardian, however, felt the full brunt of his ancient litany once again and could not withstand this additional onslaught. Ribs shattered. Wrist bones exploded in a shower of dust. Even the massive hissing skull cracked and shattered, sending the giant creature crashing to the ground. It lay there motionless, as the last of the Flammenwerfer's blaze licked hungrily at its bones before dying out. Well done, men, von Schill said from around his cigar. All in a day's work. I think we've found a home, Cameron. Well done. Von Schill clapped the librarian on the back as the two of them stood at the edge of the sinkhole. They had discovered a small antechamber beneath the marble slab, from which a carved stone staircase was leading down. The network of tunnels above them had connected to this chamber when the college was at surface level. But now only a few chambers remained intact. Cameron still wondered what had preserved the chambers as the rest of the college collapsed into the sinkhole, but knew how to graciously accept a gift when he got one. Within the intact chambers, they discovered hundreds of tomes and scrolls, enough to keep the Freikorps librarians busy for years. Sir, what are you suggesting? I want the Freikorps to have a headquarters, far from the guild's prying eyes. I think this site is an excellent choice to build one, don't you? The predatory grin on von Schull's face told Cameron the question was a rhetorical one. Deep enough in the quarantine zone that the guild won't come looking for us for years. We'll stock the esoterica for my librarians and readily repaired for solid defense. It's all about the resources, Cameron, and the Fry Corps has them. Von Schill pointed his cigar toward the pit. I need you to head up the research team here, Cameron. You're the best I have when it comes to this sort of thing. Looks like your days in the field are over. Make me a list of what you'll need. He waved his arm and shouted at a crew clearing rubble, heading their direction. Not there! There! from our sponsors. One, two. Sun! Why, don't you look like an illuminated source? Not like the rest of that trash wandering the streets, quite happy to go about their mundane, desk-jobbing existence. Not like you. Your mind has been expanded. It is beckoned by other worlds of better sensations and better people. And in reply, you hunger for it. How do we know that? That isn't important. No, what is important is you. It is all about you. Our friendly bar staff, for you. Our friendly bouncers, for you. And the ladies, well, if you're the lucky type, and I know you are, friends, they're here for you too. Put your feet up with some fine drinks and food. Try your luck at the tables. Although be careful, friends, be sure not to be seen cheating. You'd be tempted fate with that, and perhaps more pertinently, our doorman. Dance the night away with the best music the city has to offer. Where am I talking about? How stupid of me. How could I forget? We're all waiting for you at the Honeypot Lounge and Casino. In this house, everybody wins. How about going all in? Hmm, friend? Now, providing that those wild temporal shifts don't cause more havoc, I intend to take you listeners to our next story. Temporal shifts allowing. Born on the Bayou, April 21st. I cannot believe my good fortune. I have retained the services of one Silas Bullock, a local here on the Bayou's edge. 
Silas and his men have traded regularly with several gremlin settlements for the past two years and are heading out for their monthly trade excursion on the morrow. Having explained in detail what I hope to accomplish with this expedition, Silas was more than happy to offer the services of his trusty vessel, for a price, of course. The amount will sorely deplete my funds, but if his reputation is true, the money will be well spent, and I will have saved myself weeks of fumbling about in the muck trying to make contact with these creatures myself. The guild documents I was able to examine before leaving the city depict gremlins as bothersome vermin. They do not consider the creatures a thinking species. I hope my hypothesis bears out and I can disprove the mistaken classification of the gremlin and its role in Malifaux's ecosystem. I cannot contain my excitement. I believe this is how other great men have felt upon the verge of their great discoveries in science and medicine. April 22nd. The shallow-drafted vessel I was directed to was, shall we say, less than confidence-inspiring. It rode low in the water, laden with trade goods packed into barrels and crates, and the rusting steam engines clinging and clanging had me expecting it to explode the instant we pushed away from the docks. Silas greeted me warmly, extending a hand to help me aboard. He laughed at the amount of luggage I bore, especially at the camera equipment but instructed one of the hands, Clem, to stow my material starboard. After a final round of haggling on price, I handed over half the money, and we pushed off, the engine's protestations quieting down once the paddle wheel was engaged, into the inhospitable bayou. This should be the most exciting adventure of my career. Either that, or they'll rob me while I sleep, cut my throat, and dump me in the bayou. April 24th. My first encounter with the gremlins came our third day out. Clancy manoeuvred our boat slowly through the bayou, skirting sandbars, mangroves, and shallows with a veteran skill. Watching it all slide past us, I was struck by how inhospitable a place it was. Life, it seemed, was a constant struggle here, whether against the ever-encroaching environment or predators I had yet to see, but had been assured of their existence by a vigilant Philippe who stood at the bow, rifle in hand. At first, I did not realize we had arrived at our destination. One moment we were gliding around a thick stand of what could have been tall standing junipers. The next, Silas had stopped the engine, and we were drifting toward a sandy spit of land. These ends don't like the motor sound, he said. The boat slid to a stop against the sand, and despite the calm demeanor of my guides, I could not completely divorce myself of the guild reports I had read about these creatures. I noticed Philippe kept hold of his rifle, and hoped we were able to effect a quick exit if things went abruptly awry. He would remain behind and guard the boat. These gremlins were more accustomed to visits from humans than some of the ones I would see later on the trip. But Silas did not trust them, and wouldn't leave his vessel alone while he traded with their bosses. The two hands, Marco and Clem, loaded the sledge with crates of dry goods, two buckets of nails, and several bolts of what I was told was cloth. Clem told me with a snort that the gremlins weren't good at much, weaving being somewhere toward the top of the list. I was even able to convince them to include my camera equipment in the load, rather than being forced to drag it along, or worse, leave it behind in the boat. The walk to the village would be a short one, they told me. Everyone, myself included, pitched in with dragging the sledge through the sand and muck. Silas said they had tried a rolling cart, but it all too often got stuck and was impossible to keep rolling. The sledge, he said, was better for this kind of land. My aching arms and back begged to differ by the time we'd reached the village, but I kept my comments to myself. Whatever I had expected to see did not prepare me for my first glimpse of a gremlin village. Shanties of varying size and shape were scattered haphazardly about, smoke curling out of tin chimneys. A few perched above the lot on spindly wooden legs, while other stilt homes sat out over the water, a canoe or flatbed tied to rude docks at the bottom of rickety stairs. A small gremlin, barely two years old if what I'd read about their life cycle was accurate, plucked the strings of a banjo that had seen better days. His fingers froze when we came into view, but he stayed where he was on the stoop of one of the shanties, watching our antics with fascination. Other gremlins came out to see us, 
greeting Silas and Clancy with the broken English the traders had laughed about. Silas returned the greeting in the gremlin's own rude language, eliciting guffaws from those within earshot. Apparently the gremlins were not the only ones with language troubles. After the greeting, both parties settled down to haggling over the goods. I saw the gremlins had brought out their own products for trade. Jerked pig, porcine and crocodile skins, several bundles of dried herbs, and jars of a mostly clear liquid. Despite my curiosity about the trade negotiations, I wanted to see what I could of the village before they were concluded and we returned to the boat. So I gathered up my photography equipment before Silas could trade it away and went exploring. Each shanty seemed to be assembled from whatever cast-off materials its owners could find. Boards of varying size and shape were the predominant material. But here and there, I saw stone shanties. Shanties whose walls were sheets of fabric, even a shanty constructed from hundreds of individual pieces of scrapped metal crimped together at the edges. If nothing else, these gremlins were certainly innovative scavengers. As I wandered, I was watched by dozens of gremlins, some from the shelter of their shanty doorways, others glaring with malice as they fingered rusty knives and short, ugly rifles. I kept moving, making sure I appeared more confident than I felt. I hoped knowing I was with Silas' crew would keep the majority of them from violence, but I could not be certain. Instead, I made sure I was within earshot of the trade negotiations and set up the camera, taking photographs of the more intriguing shanties and trying to photograph the locals in their natural habitat. To my surprise, many of the gremlins spoke pidgin English, and I was able to gather quite a bit of information about their family groups and social structures. At their most common level, each village of gremlins is made up of family groups they call kin. I was surprised by this revelation, having used the term myself in several of my own anthropological monographs pertaining to primitive cultures. Not every gremlin in the village was related by blood, I learned, but they were all related in what appeared to be their common interest in the village's survival, which was led by a boss man who was the biggest and strongest of their number. Kin from other villages were not necessarily enemies, but none were safe from the occasional raid against other kin's villages for food, weapons, or mates. I was surprised by the gremlins' willingness to share their cultural information with me. A remarkable find, especially in light of the guild's assumption that their culture and social strata merely mimics what human society they have encountered. Equally surprising was their intense curiosity about my camera. After taking several pictures, I was answering more questions about it than I was able to ask them. They poked and prodded at it. One very forward individual went as far as to lick the lens before I could shoo him away. We are now on our way to the next village, where Clancy tells me I will see even more wonders of the gremlin world. I cannot wait, and even the theft of my lens cap by a little green thief cannot dampen my spirits. April 26th. Clancy was right. During our second trip, I was able to observe not only the subtle variations in how the village functioned in comparison with our first, namely these kin were more belligerent and distrustful of strangers, but also the foundations of gremlin culture, cultivation and herding. Gremlins in this village tended massive, brutish creatures they and the crew called pigs. Having grown up on a farm myself, I can attest to these creatures bearing a fleeting resemblance to the pigs found earthside. Growing much larger than earth pigs, these creatures and the gremlin share an odd synergy that I will endeavour to explain. At its simplest, both rely on the other as a food source. The pigs in the village's pen, I was told, were domesticated animals bred by the gremlins. They were a much more docile lot than those the gremlins hunted and were hunted by out in the bayou. I shook my head in disbelief as one of the peaceful creatures butted its tusked head against the fence we stood near, slamming it hard enough to crack the slats, as well as stun itself for several seconds. The gremlins used every bit of the pig. They used its meat, hide, even ground its bones to be used by their taxidermists as a curative. I was in for a treat, the gremlins continued. It was feeding time. Several gremlins bearing buckets, heaped with a vile assortment of things not mentioned in polite conversation, 
dumped the contents of their buckets into the pig pen. Nimbly dancing back to a safe distance as the beasts began to feed, I watched as one gremlin, slower than the rest, was caught and devoured messily by the fastest of the pigs. Rather than let the gremlins, who paid little attention to the noisy events in the pen, see my discomfort, I excused myself and wandered off in search of a quiet place in which to wretch. What I found was a collection of crude booths, seats and platforms at one end of the village. I was told the gremlins were holding some sort of festival the next day, something they referred to as a bash, where kin from the surrounding villages came and participated in games and contests. An opportunity to witness an event like the bash was too great to pass up, and after a great deal of pleading and the last of my financial reserves, I was able to convince Silas and Clancy to remain here overnight. I do hope eating gremlin cuisine is not expected of me. After the events at the pig pen, I think I may have lost my appetite for the rest of our stay. April 27th. Amazing. Simply amazing. Apparently a bash is a fair, festival and holiday celebration combined into a day of food, drink and rough and dangerous games to challenge a gremlin's survival skills. Oh, my head. I was able to avoid food for much of the day, but may have imbibed one too many of the clearish liquid the gremlins refer to as shine. An alcoholic beverage they brew. Marco described drinking shine to me as drinking liquid gold filtered through the sun. He was not lying. After recovering from the first gulp, I found the shine a warmly comforting feeling in my belly. If only I'd had more to eat. My earlier romanticizing of their culture has been tempered by the events I witnessed during hours upon hours of observing gremlin revelry. Games such as pig riding, where a gremlin sees how long it can hold onto a wild pig's bristling back, where gremlins falling from the pig's back are trampled, gored, or worse, or wildly shooting at broken bits of thrown pottery with their inaccurate boomsticks. Both activities reinforce the guild's assertions that gremlins are a conniving and violent species. Clem said some gremlins used the bash as a way to settle old scores they could not get their kin to raid another village for. I watched as this bore out during a round of target practice, where one gremlin shot dead the partner throwing the targets in the air. The shooter's aim never left his partner when the last shard was tossed. He simply fired, blowing the poor soul apart. I later learned that the shooter suspected his partner of stealing his best knife in a raid earlier this year. Toward the end of the day, the crowd's din quieted to a nervous murmur. Gremlins stepped aside as a particular group passed among them. These gremlins were led by a female, which was itself unique, as all my research and conversations had led me to believe that being boss was a male-only status. These gremlins looked oddly familiar, somehow, just as they were in elaborate hats, ponchos, even goggles. I thought back to my time at the guild library, and the passing glance I had of a group of guild agents entering the building. These gremlins looked suspiciously like those agents. But how was such a thing possible? One last thing. After the festivities died down, we returned to the boat. Philippe begged Silas to push off and put some distance between us and the village. But Silas watched the sun dipping quickly beyond the horizon. He told Philippe it would be too dangerous to travel the swamp by night. He assured Philippe, all of us really, we would head out at first light. But there was no way he would risk the vessel this evening. Philippe cursed roundly then, mostly at me and my suggestion we stay for the bash. He wormed himself into the bow of the ship, eyes alert, hands on his rifle, and said he would not sleep until we were well away from this place, cursed me once more, and took up watch on the rapidly encroaching darkness. I hope you will accept my apology before our journey is over. Oh, my aching head. Maybe some sleep will help. Philippe will never hear my apology. And I fear none of the other crew will either. I was awakened by what I thought was a splash and opened my eyes. Philippe was gone from his place in the bow. I could see the faint flicker of lights through the trees, moving away from the boat. Oblivious to the danger I was in, I scooped up Philippe's discarded rifle from where it lay on the deck and slipped out of the boat in quiet pursuit of the retreating lights. I am no woodsman, and although I tried to be quiet, 
sneaking through the wilderness with naught but the wan moonlight and a few glimpses of torchlight to show the way, resulted in me tripping over only most of the roots and branches along my path. We were back at the village, a ring of torches illuminating a ring of gremlin faces as they pushed Philippe into their midst. He stood taller than the lot of them, but a nasty cut above his eyes and his glass-eyed stare suggested he had been rendered senseless by a blow to the head with a cudgel or blackjack back at the boat. I wondered briefly if he had fallen asleep, waiting for the dawn to arrive. A susurrous chanting began, the circle of gremlins swaying softly from side to side. Their chanting voices rose slowly, building in intensity and volume. Philippe seemed to be caught in the chant's grip and began to sway himself. Damn me! But I could only watch, gripped in equal parts fear and academic curiosity. After a few minutes of this, a figure emerged from the shadows. He was a gremlin dressed in a battered top hat and black coat. He paused to take a drink from the bottle he carried in one hand, pointing the onyx head of his walking stick at Philippe with the other. I could not understand his words, but as he staggered drunkenly toward the circle, the gremlins parted, never breaking the rhythm of their chanting. Another pull from the bottle, and the gremlin spat at Philippe. But instead of spewing the bottle's contents out, the gremlin spat a blaze of flame at poor Philippe. As he was engulfed, the gremlin's spell over him was broken. I still hear his screams as he fell to the ground. The gremlin smiled, his sharp teeth glinting in the firelight, and spoke a word in perfect, clear English. Sacrifice. I ran then dropping the rifle and moving as fast as I could. The trees and undergrowth clutched at me, inviting me to stay and become the gremlin's next sacrifice. I don't know if they saw or heard me, but I thought we could escape. I tried to rouse Silas, Clem, and the others, but to no avail. Their sleep was more than drunken slumber. They were under the sway of some powerful drug. But we all drank the same shine during the day. Curse the conniving creatures! It was the food they drugged, not the drink. If only I'd eaten, perhaps they would have let us travel on in the morning. After all, they only came for one. I can hear them coming. Can see the lights heading this way. I do not even have Philippe's rifle to defend myself with. Or to... To Captain Finity. These pages were found among the half-submerged wreckage of a vessel our scouts found floating. A day's sail from Cutter's Hollow. These documents should be entered into Special Division's files, and their existence forgotten by all involved. Lucius edition of her Dungeon Diary. I can't wait to hear what happens with the Fanged Monsters First Aid School next week. Onwards, upwards and sidewards, this is Tales of Malifaux, coming to you live from the Bridgeside Broadcast Studios. Well, as alive as any of us can be, trapped in our mortal forms, fragile meat shells that they are. Everything seems fine today. I'm sure we'll all remember the reports from the weekend warning us about rogue temporal time shifts appearing today, but that has apparently not happened. The sky is a pleasant shade of threatening yellow, the low moaning from the quarantine zone is somewhat quieter than normal, and everyone seems in high spirits. Everything does seem to be on a slight slant, so as I attempt to prevent my cup of tea from slowly diving onto the floor, here is our first story. Outcasts. Squatting on his haunches, Misha shielded himself in a tumble-down...